Father God, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you, Father, for this season in which we gather together. In this time of Christmas, Father, we know the true meaning of Christmas. We understand the dates and all of these things, Father, may not be the actual dates. But, Father, we set aside this time and this moment and this opportunity to remember that God incarnate, God in man, came uh, to Bethlehem. And, Father, we thank you for your, your grace and your mercy through that babe in the manger who grew to be a great prophet, a great Messiah, and a great Savior, Redeemer, who died upon the cross, who rose to give us life everlasting. And, Father, we will praise your name forever. Be with our brothers and sisters all over the world, Father, who are suffering for Jesus. Tragedy has befalled them. They are put in prison. They are hiding right now, Father, on this day, the first day of the week, as they come together for worship. Bless them. Strengthen them. Allow your presence to be near them and undergird them with your strength. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Be back tonight, folks. We have a wonderful message on sending the light of Christmas. If we do not send the light of Christmas, who will? And I want you to understand that, folks, that's one of the reasons why God is blessing America, is because we do send the light of Christmas. So let's, let's remember that. And tonight we also have our banquet, so please keep that in mind as we return. And after our service, we'll have a time of fellowship and great time. Genesis chapter 45. Tonight our message is going to be a Christmas message, but today in the morning we're going to continue with our Genesis study. The title of my sermon tonight is The Call to Gather the Family. Now there are many times we call to gather the family. Sometimes it might be around the, <clears throat> the sickness of a family member. It might be around time for a funeral. I like sometimes that you get together for family reunions. I think that's always good to get together with family. But Joseph is making a call, and Pharaoh is going to give a call for the family to gather in Egypt. In verse 11 of Genesis chapter 45, the Bible says, There I will provide for you. Joseph is speaking to his brothers about Egypt. <clears throat> there I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. Excuse me. <clears throat> Though Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers, there is still famine in the land. Just because Jesus is coming to your heart, folks, it doesn't mean the world stops being the world. Do not underestimate the world. The world is going to be the world. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Deborah and I have this key say. We never, never am shocked that the world acts like the world. What you have to understand, folks, is the world is a wicked place. It's a place that's not our friend. It's not our home. And there's great tragedies in this world. Famine is here. But, oh, we've got one to be with, do we not? The Bible says that though we go through tra tragedy, though we go through suffering, and some of you are going to go through tragedies. Some of you are going through tragedies right now. Some of you are going through some very bleak times. But Jesus is with you. John chapter 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus said, you're going to go through tragedy. It might be the loss of a job. It might be the loss of your health. It can be all manner of things, the loss of a family member, the loss of something that's going to be devastating to you. But be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Folks, we don't have to be frightened. We don't have to be sitting in a closet somewhere hiding from the tragedies of this world. In our text today, we see evidence that there's been a battle, a battle since the beginning of time to murder, to malign, and to corrupt the lineage of the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. Satan hates the Jews. 
and always has sought to destroy them. And because we as Gentiles have become Christians, He hates us too. Because we are of the olive tree. We've been engrafted into the olive tree. He hates us the more. Genesis 3.15 says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We too are brought into this melee. But remember the words of Jesus in John 16, 33. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Folks, repeat that to yourself in your heart. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We're going to see two things today. We're going to see Joseph's grateful rest, graceful restoration and Joseph's godly resources. Let's look at verse 12. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. What a strange scripture. We'll get to this. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. And then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your animals and depart and go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your household and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. We see here in this first part of this, our text, Joseph's graceful restoration. Folks, this is the ultimate. He has tested them. He has tried them. He has put them through the tests, and they have come through in flying colors. Finally, Judah was the one who brought it all to fruition. There Judah said, as he said about Benjamin, I'm going to keep the boy. He's going to be my slave. And you go on home back to your father. And Judah intervened and said, oh, to, to Joseph, not knowing that he was Joseph, oh, sir, please take me instead. Take me and let the boy go home. And there he substituted himself. Later on, another son of Judah, one who was found of grace and glory, one who came incarnated into a physical body there in the little town of Bethlehem, Ephrata, as the Bible says in Micah 5, 2. There came Jesus, the son of David, the son of Judah, who said, substitute me, Father. Let them go, but substitute me. And so we see this great opportunity. The final fruition of the test came when there was one who was willing to step in the line, one who was willing to say, take me, one who was willing, I'll pay the price. And that's when the test was completed. So we see now that as they've come together, Joseph begins to speak to them. Look at verse 12 and 13. We see Joseph's reassurance is revealed. In verse 12, look at his abrupt acknowledgement. Do you see the surprise of the brothers? They're speechless. Look at verse 12 again. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Hello, up here, he says. <laughs> They're shocked. They're absolutely speechless. We see the surprise of the brothers and the shock of Benjamin. They don't know what to say. Why is this? The source of their bewilderment is simple. In Genesis chapter 42 and verse 23, it says, But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. You see, Joseph did not speak directly to them up until this point. Up until this point, Joseph, until he told everyone to leave, up until this point, Joseph spoke to his brothers in an Egyptian language through an interpreter that they might hear. Oh, folks, sometimes we read the Old Testament, it felt like we were going through an interpreter. Many times it felt like, I don't understand this. I don't know what I'm hearing. I need someone to help me understand. And then Jesus came, and he spoke to us in the language of love that we understood. 
and that the New Testament opened the Old Testament that we could understand. And we were in dismay and we were shocked sometimes to hear in our own words, in our own language, the love of God. And Joseph spoke to them. He said, wake up. It's my mouth that's speaking to you. Yes, you are hearing me in Hebrew. Yes, you are hearing me in, in all, these different, all these different languages around here. You are hearing me in your words. Now, folks, before we get thinking that the Jewish people were seven, eight million people like they are today, you have to understand Hebrew was only spoken by one family. And that was the family of, of Judah or of Jacob. And so we see here that they had never heard someone else of a different lineage, perhaps speaking Hebrew, except their interpreter. And so they were shocked. We see an abrupt acknowledgement, but we see his amazing announcement in verse 13. He says, don't be shocked. It's me. It's Joseph. I'm speaking to you in my own language. But look at verse 13. So you go tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen. We see Joseph's revelation of reality. Here am I. I'm no longer a babe in a manger. I'm no longer somebody that's been cast aside by Herod. I am the Son of God, the living Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Joseph said to him, now you look at me. I'm the prime minister of Egypt. I'm not some boy in a hole somewhere. I'm not some boy you sold on the road to slavery. I'm not some boy that lived in Potiphar's house. It was put in prison. I am the prime minister of Egypt. There is no one greater than me, Joseph said, except Pharaoh. We see his revelation of reality. Joseph is alive. He's a prime minister. He's in a position of a savior. He went from high position in the family to the pit, to the plight of slavery, to Potiphar's house, to prison. Now he's prime minister. We see Joseph's request of reunion in verse 13. And you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Oh, imagine the shock. Imagine the shock on those boys' faces. They still couldn't speak. They were shocked. Imagine the shock. Imagine the shock when Jesus reveals himself to the lost world. Imagine the dismay that they will have. Imagine the speechlessness when he says to the atheist, I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I am the creator of all things. Imagine the, the dismay of, the, of the, creation, the, the atheist who said there is no creation. Imagine the agnostic who says, well, I just didn't know for sure if you existed. Well, duh, here I sit. Folks, listen, one day they're going to be speechless, are they not? They can have all the billboards they want. Folks, you look at what they're going to do in New York City. They're going to put a billboard up and talk about Santa Claus and how, he's a, and, and, and how hateful it is about Jesus. But I want you to understand the true identity and position of Jesus will come through one day and they will stand speechless before him. They won't know what to say. They won't know what to think. Remember what Jesus said, folks. I have overcome the world. We see in verse 14 and 15, not only Joseph's reassurance revealed, but Joseph's relationship restored. This is pure grace, folks. Verse 14 and 15 is pure grace. Nothing that the brothers have done merits this. There's nothing that they've done. Oh, they brought their trinkets to pay for a few pieces of grain and a couple of bags of rice or whatever they had. They were going to take back with them. But, beloved, they did nothing to deserve this. Joseph is bringing pure grace to them. And so it is with Jesus. Grace is truly amazing. It is the story of Christmas. Grace has come into this world. Folks, the greatest Christmas gift under a tree is the grace of Jesus Christ. That's why this tree we have here before you is not only a great Christmas tree, it is a grace Christmas tree. It speaks of the nails upon the body of Jesus. It speaks of the crown of thorns that Jesus took for us. It speaks of the Almighty God, the Creator. All things are made in Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Oh, the greatest gift of Christmas is Jesus. The greatest Christmas gift that anyone can receive 
is Jesus. I remember many years ago on Christmas Eve, I was, I was having a little small devotional, as we always do at Christmas Eve, and I remember thinking, well, I, I'm running very short. I need to get this done, and, and I'll, I, you know, I don't know why I'm doing an altar call, but I'll do one because the Holy Spirit has prompted me to do one. I don't know why, and I, and I gave a little altar call, and here's what I said. I said, folks, here's what you've done this Christmas. You've unwrapped the gift, kept the tinsel in the box, and threw away the gift. Jesus is the gift of Christmas, and you've thrown away the gift. Would you receive the gift today? And lo and behold, as I gave an altar call, one man came down the, the, the aisle. I thought he was already saved. He was a visitor and had been attending our church for many, many years, of many, many months. He'd come all the way from Georgia, came up to our church. In fact, the family had called us and, and had met a friend of ours that we used to live next door down into Georgia. And they said, oh, if you go to church, you need to go to our friend's church in Fort Wayne. And they came, and lo and behold, he came forward. And I said, you coming to join the church, brother? He says, no, I'm coming to be saved. I want the gift of Christmas. And folks, that's what it's all about, pure grace. Look at verse 14, the affection of a maternal sibling. Verse 14 says, and then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. Folks, there was no embarrassment here. He said, I love you, brother. And he said, I want to show you that I love you. And Joseph wept and hugged him and kissed him. And we see not only the, the affection of this brother, but we see the reciprocation of Joseph's brother. He loved him back. Do you see that? You see, the reunion of Joseph's banishment is simple. I'm back. I'm here. Benjamin, I'm here. You see, one day Jesus is coming again. And we will hug his neck as he hugs us. And he'll weep with us and cry with us. And he'll welcome us back one day. Oh, as the carol says, wonderful message we bring. Glorious carol we sing. Wonderful words of the King. Jesus is coming again. Oh, beloved, listen. Everything about Christmas ought to say Jesus is coming again. And we see here the reunion of Joseph's banishment and the reciprocation of Joseph's brother. Oh, beloved, one day like Benjamin, we'll hug the neck of Jesus. We'll weep and cry with Jesus. But oh, it'll be worth it all one day when we see him. Oh, the pain, the suffering, the tragedy that we undergo, the heartache we have, the sadness in our families. Oh, beloved, it'll be worth it all one day when we see Jesus and we hug him by the neck and he falls on us and hugs us by the neck. There'll be no tragedy that'll be so great. There'll be no pit so deep that the love of God will not be deeper still. Joseph could not hold it within him not to love his brother. And we see in verse 15 the affection of the mercy shared. Okay, I love my brother, but do I love my other brothers? In verse 15, the Bible says, And moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. We see a time of graceful forgiveness. Joseph said, Oh, brothers, I forgive you. Oh, isn't that, tra isn't that sweet? One day, we'll stand before Jesus, there at the gate perhaps, there on the road to our, our, our new home that he has built for us. Perhaps it'll be on the way there at Glory Hallelujah Square that we'll stop there at the corner. And Jesus will say, this is your new house. And suddenly it'll be overwhelming. We'll say to him, oh, Jesus, I'm so sorry. And he'll say, I forgive you, brother. I love you, sister. And I'm going to give you this new home and this new life. And, oh, beloved, he'll weep with us, and he'll hug our neck. All hatred and bitterness and anxiety is a fruit of nothing but destruction and death. Only forgiveness gives life, folks. Death comes because we become bitter. We become stifled by our emotions. We become angry within ourselves, and hatred literally eats us alive and buries us in a forgotten hole somewhere. Oh, beloved, let me say to this, if you have bitterness and anger and hatred in your soul, let it go. Take within yourselves the forgiveness of Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said. Weep and hold one another. If you have family today, this is a better time. There's no time greater 
than Christmas time to bring your family home and love them for Jesus and tell them that you love them, tell them that you forgive them, tell them that you care, ask them to forgive you, whatever you need to do. Oh, what a time of affection. But it was a time of grateful fellowship. Do you see that in verse 15? Oh, the Bible says, and after that, his brothers talked with him. They shared, oh, you know, we're so sorry, but you know, this is what you missed. And Joseph said, oh, I missed nothing. I went through trouble and tribulation, but look at this, brothers. Look what I've got. So we see here in Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Joseph said, brother, I'm not holding this against you. What you meant for evil, God allowed good to come out of. Look at verse 16 through 18, Joseph's ratification of resources. We see his relationship restored. We see his reassurance revealed. But look at verse 16 through 18, his ratification of resources. Look at the pleasure of Pharaoh in verse 16. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brothers have come, so it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. We see the report of the excitement. What's going down in Joseph's house? Man, there's a big racket down there. I don't know what's going on. I hear laughter, but then I hear crying. I hear shouting, but then I hear mumbling. What's going on down there? All the servants have been dismissed. Everybody's out in the street. They're hearing what's going on. What's going on in that house? Oh, folks, Jesus is in the house. I love that scripture in the scriptures that says, when it was noised about that Jesus was in the house. The house was full when it was noised about that Jesus was in the house. Oh, folks, when it's noised about that Jesus is here, this house will be filled. When your family and friends find out that Jesus is here, they'll be here. When your neighbors find out that Jesus is here, they'll be here. Folks, everybody wanted to know what was going down at Joe's house. What a party. What's going on? Well, we see here the report of the excitement, but we see the rejoicing of the Egyptians. Oh, my, they were excited. Joe's family's been restored. Joe's family's back together. Joe's family is together. What's going on? They were rejoicing. Next, in verse 17 and 18, we see the proposal of Pharaoh. Not only the pleasure, but look at the proposal in verse 17, his permission for their departure. You do understand, you can't leave unless Pharaoh gives you permission. Do you see that in verse 17? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Oh, beloved, one day we're going to hear the trumpet call. And the Lord is going to call us back home. And we're going to load our brothers. And we're going to say to our brothers, it's time to go home. And we're going to leave this place. The Bible says we're going to be taken up in the, into the, into the uh, heaven to be with the Lord forevermore. It's his permission for their departure. But look at his plan for their destiny in verse 18. In verse 18, the Bible says simply, Bring your father and your household and come to me, and I will give you the best land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Oh, folks, we're going to come back one day and rule and reign with him. This is a picture of the kingdom. The promises were given to the church that we would be caught up together to be with Christ in the air, and we would come back into the kingdom to rule and reign. I want you to keep your ribbon here in Genesis because we're going to come back to it. I want you to go all the way to the end of your Bible, to the book of Revelation. I want you to see a promise that was written to a corrupt church era. The church right before the Laodicean period, Revelation chapter 2. I believe, beloved, we are living in the church or the era of the church of Laodicea. But look what Jesus says to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. And starting with verse 26, it's, it's, it's almost to the church of Laodicea. There's one more church after that, the church of Sardis and then Philadelphia. And then we have the church of Laodicea. So I, I really want to show you this. This is the, the corrupt church in Revelation 2. Look at verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my father, I will give to him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, what the Spirit says to the Christians. One day, beloved, 
the King of kings and Lord of lords is going to give us permission to rule and reign with him. So we see the permission of the departure, the plan for their destiny, and beloved, that's what Christmas is all about. Look at verse 19 through 23. We see finally Joseph's godly resources. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, and the world and those who dwell therein. This is all God's, by the way. Everything you see is God's. You go down to the mall, it's all God's. You go down to Jefferson Point, it's all God's. You go to your home, it's all God's. You come to the church, it's all God's. Look at verse 19 and 20. Pharaoh's command is declared. Now you are commanded. He said, this is not a suggestion. You are commanded, do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives and bring them to your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to, them all, gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garment. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father's journey. We see here the command of Pharaoh in verse 19. Look at the luxury of Pharaoh's gifts. We see a royal escort. What did he do in verse 19? Now you're commanded, take carts out of the land of Egypt. Now this was an unheard of thing. Egyptians did not export carts wagons, nor chariots. This is what we're talking about. All of these three items, any cart, any wagon, or chariot, could be turned into a war machine. It was like the tanks of our time. And Pharaoh and all of Egypt never exported anything like that. They never let any of these things out. And Pharaoh is telling Joseph, let them have whatever they want. Let them take the carts. Let them take the chariots. Let them take the wagons. Let them go, because I trust you, Joseph, and they are coming back. Listen, God has equipped you, beloved. He's escorting you every day of your life, and he's equipped you for each and every day to live as you need to live for him. Just open your eyes and see what God has given you. A royal escort, carts, wagons, chariot. These were all Egyptian. Do you see that in verse, verse 19? Now you're commanded to do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt. When somebody saw it on the road, they knew it was an Egyptian. Well, you know, we were going down the road the other day, and I saw a car, and I thought, what kind of car is that? I've never seen one like that before. Drove by, I still don't know what kind of car it was. It was interesting. I might even like to buy one. Probably can't afford it, but it was an interesting-looking car. But the bottom line is, folks, the Egyptians were going to get them. They had a royal escort. And then look at the royal entourage in verse 19. The Bible says, for your little ones and your wives, bring your father and come. They were coming back with a royal escort. Oh, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And one day Jesus is going to take us back. He's not going to give us some old rotten, beat up cart folks to go back with. He's not going to give us some old gold chariot to ride in. He's going to give us a new body and a new hope. And he's going to give us something, folks, that we're going to have. It's going to last forever. It'll be a royal entourage all the way back home. Some of you, wouldn't you change your body right now for another one? If I could tell you we could give you a new body, wouldn't you line up to get one? Oh, listen, I'm telling you right now, folks, one day he's going to call us and he said, go get them with the carts and the chariots and the wagons and, the, and all of that. Go get them. And he's going to give us a new body. We're going to meet him in the air and there we'll be with the Lord forever. Oh, beloved, listen, Joseph had a royal gift from Pharaoh. Pharaoh trusted Joseph. That's why he allowed the use of carts and wagons. A chariot or a wagon become a, could become a war machine. And so he allowed him because he trusted. Look at verse 20. All things are given to Jesus, by the way. Verse 20, also do not be concerned about your goods. Don't have to worry what you pack. Oh, I hate packing, don't you? I hate packing. Man, you know, i got a father-in-law. If he's coming, he'll pack three months ahead of time. I can't do that. Number one, I don't have that many pair of underwear and undershirt. The bottom line is, he packs three months ahead of time. Pharaoh says, don't pack. 
Leave that junk at home. Leave that stuff. Folks, some of you need to let go of some stuff in your life. Jesus says, let it go. Leave it at home. Let it go. Why? Because we see here in verse, verse 20, it's simple. Do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Oh, one day, folks, we're going to walk on streets of gold. We're going to go down streets of gold and see people with perfect bodies. The angels will walk by and watch us as we walk by them. They'll go, woohoo! look at him. He looks just like Jesus. Want to be sweet? Oh, listen, folks, one day we'll have a new body, a new life, a new world. We see his instructions for discernment. Don't hold on to the junk. Let the junk go, folks. There's things in this world you've got to let go of. Don't drag it with you down into that old decrepit hole called the grave. Let it go and take a hold of what God has given for you. The insistence of his distribution in verse 20. I'll give you the best, he said. Leave that junk at home. Look at verse 20 through 23. Pharaoh's command is discharged. In verse 21, the discharge of Pharaoh's benevolence. And the sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh. And they gave them provisions for the journey. Oh, folks, there's transportation for the journey. How am I going to get to heaven? Oh, he's got a new body for you. He's got a new life for you, folks. He's going to take you there. How am I going to get to heaven? Philip asked. Oh, Jesus said, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What are you going to do, preacher, when the old death angel comes and places his icy hand upon your body, comes to claim that old physical temple of clay, that jar of clay that you've been given by mom and dad? What are you going to do when that tent that you're in begins to collapse and fall apart? Oh, beloved, I'm going to let it go and hold on to the hand of Jesus. One day, beloved, we're going to let it all go. Transportation for the journey. Treasures for the journey, too. We're going to have provisions. Oh, I don't know what it's all going to be about, but, beloved, we're going to have a glorious reunion with Jesus. He's going to give us the plan, the treasures to go. God has a plan for us, too, in the kingdom. Oh, one day you're going to, you're going to say to me, Preacher, you're right. You preach right. Listen, folks, live like it. Live like it. Live for the rest of your life that Jesus is coming and going to take you to be home with him. Look finally at verse 22 and 23, the details of Joseph's bounty. Look at gifts given to the faithful in verse 22. And he gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garment. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garment. Folks, there are going to be different rewards in heaven. There are some people who are going to get crowns, and there are going to some people who get multiple crowns. There are some people who are just going to get in by the skin of their teeth, and they're not going to have any crowns at all. He, we see here he's given gifts to the faithful. Benjamin has been faithful. In his heart, he must have loved Joseph. He must have thought of Joseph many times. And Joseph discerned that, and he said, I'm going to give my beloved brother that which he deserves. And look at verse 23, gifts given to the fruitful. Oh, for those of you who live for Jesus, those of you who produce fruit in your life, look at verse 23. And he said to his father, these things, 10 donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. Oh, beloved, we're going to have gifts. Matthew 25, 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Oh, folks, one day, one day, Jesus is going to give us what we have deserved. Look at Genesis chapter 45 and verse 24 as we close. And so he sent his brothers away, and they departed. They were commissioned. Go. And he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Can I tell you, can I give you the description of what that is? That's challenge. That, that we see a commission go, but we see a challenge. Don't goof up on the way home. Don't blame each other. Don't fight among each other. Don't be stupid. Okay? Go home, get dad. Don't worry about who blames who. Let it all go. It's forgiven. Don't bring up sins that have been forgiven. Don't think about, well, look at old brother so-and-so. What about sister so-and-so? Let it go and literally go home and get, and get ready to come back. We see commissioned, challenged, changed oh beloved joseph had a great opportunity for his brothers 
He could have brought great glory or he could have brought great, great tragedy. He decided to be like God and be great glory to them. Let this Christmas be a time of great glory. Let this Christmas be a time of changing a life, not only someone else's life, but perhaps yours. Change your life. Become a new person. Follow Christ. Say, I'm going to be like Joseph for Christmas and live my life for him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that Joseph was a man of God and that in his heart, Father, you changed him to be a man of grace and a man of glory. And, oh, Father God, let women and men today choose to be like Joseph. Let them choose, Father, to be the grace and glory of your love. And, Father God, I ask that you challenge us. Challenge us today, Father God. Commission us today that we might live our lives for Jesus. And, Father, if there's someone here today without Christ, let it be known to them right now. Speak to that heart right now and tell them to come. Tell them to come. And, Father, if they'll take me by the hand, we'll show them Jesus. We'll show them the new life. We'll show them how to receive the glory of God and the forgiveness of sins. Oh, Father God, let your will be done today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.